I have with me Stefan Molyneux. I uh, interviewed Stefan for my FallenState.tv show, and it will air uh, um, tomorrow, a live premiere tomorrow at 12 noon, the FallenState.tv. And on there we talked about uh, his relationship with his father, and I had suggested that Stefan should go and forgive his father, but uh, uh, apparently his father died last week or, the, or maybe the week before. I'll find out here in a minute. But Stefan is a philosopher and host of Free Domain, Free Domain, and we'll tell you how to get all that. But I wanted to talk to him because I have so much respect for this guy. He's like, when I first heard of him, I'm like, wow. And then I found out he lived in Canada. And um, uh, and I've always want, I've been on his show several times. I always wanted to interview him. So I got the chance to do it for the Fall of State. He's back now. And I wanted to talk to him about his father's situ- situation, how he's feeling about all that. Uh, Stefan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jesse. It's great to be here. I really appreciate you coming on. Before we get to this, your father's situation and you and your father's situation, uh, can I play a sound bite and I can get his opinion about? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're having uh, the Chinese virus situation here in America, as you know, and the government don't want to let go. They don't want the people to go back to work. They want to control the people. And so I had this video that I can play for my audience here in a minute. I thought, let me ask Stefan what he think about this. But I'm being told right now you can hear it, but you won't be able to see it. And so I won't play it, but I'll just tell you about it. And yes. uh, in, uh, this is from MIT Technology. MIT is working on a software that can detect if you are following social distancing so what they're doing is working on this software that they'll put it out there on the streets. And if you don't have on a, if you're not separated the way they think you should be, uh, a red light will come on and they can get you for that. Uh, it's a surveillance footage software. What do you think about the idea that the government is creating and doing this type of thing? Oh, it's beyond horrible, Jesse. I mean, this is exactly what the great fear of the government comes from is that they will exploit a disaster in order to further control the people. Look, if it's really, really bad to get close to each other, if it's really, really bad to get out of your house or to go to a playground, then why on earth are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of guest workers and migrants and seasonal laborers coming pouring into America over the next little while? This is all completely ridiculous. If America is open for business from those who want to come in and undercut honorable Americans who want to do jobs, then how on earth are we confined to our homes? It is ridiculous beyond words and horrifying. There's this woman by the name of Alexander Cortez. She's a Democrat and she's in Congress. She said on an interview uh, that people should say no about opening up society. People should say no about going back to, about going back to work. She doesn't want them to go back. Well, of course, I mean, because there are many of the elites who hate economic freedoms, who hate our free markets, who hate our opportunity to work, who hate capitalism, who hate economic opportunity. And in particular, they hate the kind of freedoms that can lift people out of poverty. Because I was just listening to you tell your last caller, you know, you're a grown man, you shouldn't be living with your mama and (laughs) can't agree with you more. But, you know, we're grown men. We shouldn't be depending on the state for right. our daily bread. Yeah. That, is a, that is a sin uh, morally and economically. Um, when I was growing up, uh, this would not have happened because the people were more aware of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. It was talked about. It was known about. And people would try. The, uh, the citizen made sure the government protected that. Now the young people, millennials and Zs, they don't know about the Constitution. They're not aware of how freedom works, at least in this country. Is there any way to stop the government without knowing and understanding the Constitution? Yeah, and I would also argue that knowing and understanding the Constitution is knowing and understanding a higher morality than our daily needs. This is the whole point of us being not 
apes, not animals, is we're supposed to be able to focus on something that is higher than our own immediate needs, rather than being some greedy jab of the hut wannabe who stuffs food into his mouth and stuffs our body organs into <laughs> other people and sleeps when they're tired. We're supposed to have a higher calling. And the only way a moral society can function is if the people who disobey those morals are very few in number yeah. and not part of the uh, police force and not part of the court system and not part of the political elites. Uh, this is how America was founded. Uh, it said it was founded as a Christian nation and only Christian morality can sustain it. Yeah. And as people have fallen away from Christianity, and it's not like they've ended up in my corner uh, by the billions uh, as uh, moral philosophers. So uh, if you have people who are just looking to maximize their pleasure in the moment, whether that pleasure is controlling others through sadistic uh, de desires or whether that pleasure is for sexual access, regardless of consequences or for food, regardless of health consequences, then if we can't defer our gratifications, we don't deserve and we will not keep the civilization we have inherited from people who knew how to put pleasure in its proper place. That's amazing. I totally agree. I um, was talking this morning about I, I work with a lot of men around the country and around the world now. And I know a lot of young men, when I say young, they're 18 and over. And they're living at home with their mothers. They have no jobs. They are high off drugs and pot and other types of drugs. And they don't seem to mind. They are not. It's something missing within that would cause them to fight for their lives. You know, I got to get over this drug. I got to get me a job. I got to be out on my own. They seem to have settled. I remember once when I moved from uh, Alabama to Los Angeles in my early 20s, I met friends and I ended up smoking pot. But I still had that drive. I knew I wasn't going to stay on pot. I had to fight to get off, and I did. But I also knew to take care of myself, to work to have my own place, to pay my bills and stuff. A lot of young men today seem to be comfortable with living at home and on drugs and no job. What happened to that? And how can they overcome that? Well, I'll tell you, Jesse, I think it comes back to the family. It comes back yeah. to our primary relationships. So I have uh, been a foe uh, for many decades of government control of healthcare, government control of medicine. I think it's extremely dangerous. I think you get some short term benefits like any drug, but in the long term, having people who are addicted to power in charge of your access to healthcare yeah. is a very bad, very bad idea. And I, I remember talking about this with my mother and my mother. I was raised by a single mother, of course, as you know, yes. and my mother got so insanely angry. It was beyond belief, right? Now, this is partly because she's a hypochondriac and loves going to doctors to get uh, them to poke and prod and have conversations and gain pity and all of that. And so the problem is the system that we have right now is unsustainable and it's largely unsustainable because of debt. And it's largely unsustainable because of debt because of the welfare state. And the welfare state is almost totally the single mother state. So yeah. if you're talking about finding a way to have our system survive, you have to talk about ending the welfare state. And we can talk about that in abstract moral and economic terms, but the problem is if you have a single mom who's dependent on the welfare state and you start talking about ending the welfare state, I guarantee you that single mom, your own mother, the woman who gave birth to you and raised you, is going to take that very personally and get very angry. Yeah. And so the path to saving our society runs directly into the uh, against the interests of many of our mothers, and that is, uh, that is a very, very tough thing to overcome. That's amazing because that's what happened to the black people in America is that uh, the civil rights movement started and they became the head of the people. And the civil rights movement made a deal with the government, uh, especially the Democratic government. OK. And they told the black people, we're your leaders. You have to listen to us. And they went to the government and made a deal. OK, government, you need to give the black people welfare. You need to take care of them for this phony idea of racism, right? And then the blacks said yes to that. I'm glad my family didn't say yes to that, but a lot of black people said yes to that. And I remember when the social worker would come around, uh, they said, you can't have a man in the home. You can't be married, yeah. you can't have a husband. And those women who were married, they would make their husband hide for the day or leave home. So the social worker would not know it. And then the social worker would give them a check you know, sign them up for a check. And it's just been downhill ever since. And so today, if you try to take government away from the blacks, they'll cut your head off. 
before they let you take the government away. Well, it is a, it's a terrible shame. And I think it was not done, of course, with any interest in the black community or for the black community in the long run. Right. And of course, as you know, and as you've pointed out repeatedly, the same thing's happening to other communities, the white communities and so on. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, it's about a generation behind, but it's just as brutal. But I think they did it uh, because they wanted to wreck the system that was. They associated the evils of Jim Crow and segregation and slavery with capitalism with the free market but slavery had nothing to do with the free market that's right and and all of these slavery is a government program it <laughs> requires the government to enforce it like in brazil they ended slavery by just stopping enforcing slave contracts and boom the slaves were free it didn't even <laughs> take a civil war that killed six hundred thousand men so slavery is a government program what was jim crow jim crow was a government program what was yeah. segregation segregation was a government program if you look at one of the origins of the civil rights movements rosa parks on the basketball a she was a communist subversive who was trained in in yeah. that sort of stuff but also the the bus the bus companies didn't want to segregate against blacks because blacks were one of their biggest customers they didn't want to offend and upset their customers they were forced to by the state so what happens is the government has all these terrible programs that harms minorities that harms blacks that harms hispanics and then people come along and say well the problem you see is not the government that forces the bus company to have you sit in the back the problem is the bus company and that the, the solution is to surrender even more power and even more control by the government. My gosh, Jesse, that's how they get you. Yeah, exactly. And the last question about that, because I, I brought you on to talk about your father. Um, why can't white people look at the physical example of the blacks and say, you know what? I'm not going down that road. I'm not going to destroy my family. I'm not going to allow my kids to be relying on the government and all that because they see the destruction in the black community, at least here in this country. Why can't the white people look at that and say, no, I'm not going down that road? Because they are going down the same road that, that the blacks have, uh, have gone down and are going down. So it's, it's a big question. Um, it's kind of funny that you brought me on to talk about my dad and uh, no. <laughs> didn't talk about my mom. <laughs> but anyway, that's natural, I suppose. So uh, look, I mean, I think a lot of the brutality and, and tragedy within the black community has largely been hidden from society as a whole. Because like the smoking company doesn't want to show you someone who got sick from smoking, right? And the yeah. government doesn't want to show you the advanced destruction that has occurred in other communities for fear that you're going to turn back and also rescue your brothers and sisters who were, you know, further down that road. So, I mean, a lot of, of course, a lot of white people don't live in black neighborhoods. Uh, they maybe get their view of blacks from television, which is pretty sanitized, and they don't actually see. Like every now and then uh, when the topic arises, I'll post the fact that a study shows that uh, about half of black girls are raped by black men before they turn 18. Now that is a horrendous, I mean, my first goal is always to protect children in society. They're the most vulnerable. They have the least voice. They have the fewest rights, and they need the yeah. most protection from people who see and people are absolutely shocked at that. And I show them the study and it's like, yeah, it's not 100%. It's not 100% of, of everyone who answered, but you know, it's a pretty big indication of, of what's going on. And a lot of that has to do with the single mother state. Like if you wanna prey on children, first thing you need to do is separate the male line from the herd, right? First thing you gotta do is get that husband, get that father of those children out of the house. Yeah. And then you can date the single mom and you can prey on the kids. And this is why child abuse from um, non-related males in the household, like males who are not biologically related, that child abuse is over 30 times yeah. higher than what it is if there's a, a biological father. And I knew this, I knew this kind of stuff growing up, right? I didn't know the data, but I had friends from, you know, single mother households who were talking about the dangerous men in the house. And my mom had dangerous men in the house. You, you're you uh, going to bed and waking up every day in a lion cage. I mean, yeah. it's a dangerous, dangerous situation. We got to And so I, I think there's a lot of sanitizing and people don't see uh, all of the horrors that are going on, because if they did, not only would whites turn back, but we'd work a lot harder to try and rescue everyone else. Yes, absolutely. So I want to get to your father's situation. Um, I heard you say that your father aspired, may his soul rest in peace, and I definitely wish you guys well in dealing with that. How is it going for, and obviously, you, you, know, you know, your talks on your, on your radio show there, but how are things going for you personally now that your father has aspired, and did you get a chance to talk to him after we talked? I did not talk to him after we talked. Um, I had um, a number of conversations with him in the past, uh, trying to talk about uh, what happened in my childhood, trying to talk about what was important to me. Uh, I did get 
rebuffed and rejected uh, every time. He just refused uh, to talk about it, and this was some years ago. So uh, I did not talk to him again before he died. But I did, tell, as I mentioned on my show, I, I did wrote a poem. I wrote a poem many years ago about, oh gosh, I was in my early 20s, so uh, a long, long time ago, uh, 30 years or so. And it was about the death of a father. And I wrote it for a friend of mine whose father died, and she read it as a f his funeral. It's called Farewell Father, and it's about dealing with the death of your father and the poem basically sat in my drawer for 30 years and then I just published it on my show a couple of days before he died. It was yeah. just the most, the strangest uh, coincidence. So as far as my emotions go, I'm, I'm split. I'm, I'm, I'm two people, uh, which I guess is good because it's down from more people that I often am. So uh, <laughs> I'm down to two people. And one person <laughs> is the part of me that says, you know, this was your father. This was the guy who, although he didn't stick around and made I think terrible decisions. He did give you life, and and there were some interactions that mattered. That's part of me that says this is a significant life event. And then there's another part of me that says, okay, that's all well and good from a sentimentality, sentimentally, sorry, sentimental, sentimentality standpoint. But what practical difference does it make in my life, given that I hadn't seen or spoken with my father in many, many years, yeah. that he's dead? I mean, I get it from an abstract standpoint. But there's a, I don't know if it's a cynical, cynical part of me or a part of me that's just too practical, or maybe it's the right amount of practicality. I don't know. But part of me is moved deeply, and part of me is like, eh, you know, I mean, when I look at it from a day to day standpoint, what has really changed? So your father uh, left home when, he, when you were six years old. Um, no, no, six months. When you were six months. Oh, they have six yeah. years. That's amazing, man. And did you ever ask him, why did you leave? I did. I did. And what did he say? I did. His answer was twofold. One was that my mother um, has, has not got the sweetest disposition in the known universe, to put it <laughs> as nicely as I can. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the family court system is very anti-male and women can really use it as a vengeful bouncer to drag a man uh, along uh, through the bramble hedge of statist power for many years if she so chooses. And he was, uh, there was some concern about that, but also because he studied to be a geologist and my mother was, and we moved between Ireland and England, there's not a lot of gold mines there. Yeah. And he had to return to Africa, which is um, where he lived and where he studied and where he spent his career. Did, uh, when he told you why he left, did that help you to understand at all? Is that, um, excuse me that your father left your mother, he did not leave you. He loved you. It's just that as most men can't handle the women, the woman, the women in their lives, they end up leaving the woman, but not their children. And the woman make it difficult for the father to have a natural relationship with their children. Did you understand at all that he didn't leave you? He left your mother because he didn't know how to deal with that. And he loved you. He, he actually did give me a beautiful gift of explaining his life. Yeah. And when you hear someone explain his life, it does lift an enormous burden from you. And I would not be the man today if my, if my father had not given me that great gift about 30 years ago of explaining his life. Yeah. Uh, because when you hear someone say, well, here's why I did what I did, it does take a yeah. big burden off you. And uh, it does help you not look at things like everything just revolves around you, but other people have their own lives, their own histories. I mean, look, I was never really of the opinion that I had done something to offend him when I was six months old. I was pretty sure I didn't like pee in his eye or something. And he's like, that's it. This kid is rude. I'm out of here. Right. Like that was not part of my thinking. But realizing, of course, you know, it's kind of tough to look at your parents and remember that they, you know, they were a kid like you, they yeah. have their history, they have their baggage. I do this with my own daughter. I, I'll talk from time to time about my own childhood to remind her, you know, so when I was your age, we moved to Canada and so on. Just to remind her that, you know, I'm not just this big giant half God in the sky who was born this way, but I went through all the same things that she's going through because I don't want her to worship me because when you worship someone, when you yeah. find a flaw, you tend to turn to, to, to well, uh, neutrality or, or negative feelings, but if you love someone, you accept them with their flaws and history and everything. So Absolutely. I did come to a lot of reconciliation with regards to that stuff, and that was uh, that was my father's doing. I want you to ask. I want to ask about the letter, but let me ask. So, did you forgive him once he explained to you 
I left your mother. I did not leave you. I love you. Did that cause you to forgive him? I will say this, that because I, yeah, I want to make sure we're using the same word, but I will say this. I can absolutely, completely and totally see that in his position, I may very well have done the same thing. In other words, having spent most of his youth getting an education, he went all the way to a PhD and all of that, and not being able to practice his, uh, his work uh, where, where I was and, you know, my mother not going to move to where he was, uh, he had to make money, he had to have a life, and just sitting in a tiny apartment trying to find a low-rent job while being harassed by the courts, <laughs> I can absolutely, completely and totally see how and why he made the decisions yeah. that he made. And... Uh, I, if that makes sense, that's, yes. and therefore I don't harbor a resentment in, in that way. Because I totally it's, understand it's a system. That. Yeah. yeah. And so did you forgive your mother for turning you away from him and the things that she did? Did you go to her and forgive her for what she did? Wow. Actually, I was just here to talk about my dad because that's a lot easier. Uh, if we can, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, my mother's a, it's a, it's a tougher one. My mother is, is definitely a, a tougher one. My father's absence is something that you kind of have to work through emotionally. Yeah. But there's not sort of physical scars that remain. Right. But, yeah, my mother's violence is sort of a different matter. Like that's not an abstract thing. Like I'm mourning something that's not there. I'm sad. I'm not sad or kind of thing. But um, I don't know what kind of devils, in fact, possessed my mother to commit the kind of violence against me that she did. Uh, that's a that's a tougher uh, canyon to cross. Do you realize? Do you realize that your mother had her issues? She could not help herself. She resented her mother, and it's just been passed on from generation to generation. And unless you forgive, you become like what you hate. Even though you try to get away from it, you try to be nice, nicer or whatever, but you still end up doing the same thing. So why not? Just as you understood your mother's situ your father's situation, because he shared it and told you. Why not realize that your mother, yes, she's crazy, yes, she's wrong, but she simply cannot help herself. Go to her and forgive her. Hey, I'm sorry for resenting you for what you've done to me. I realize now you can help yourself. Your whole world would open up even more so if you did that. Why not do it? And it would be the hardest thing you ever have to do in life. <laughs> well, I certainly agree with you there, brother. Well, okay, Why not so, do so that? Here's, here's, here's the challenge, right? And I was just thinking about this uh, two days ago. So here's the challenge for me. Free will. Free will is like, it's the, it's my navigation system. It's the foundation of everything I do. What do I do? I, I debate with the world and try to get the world to change its mind as you do to try and get people to become enlightened, to try and get people to put their higher interests first, yeah. to, to let, let go of immediate happiness for the sake of long-term happiness, which I guess is kind of what you're trying to do with me here today, <laughs> which I appreciate. But, but no, here's, so, the problem is that if I say to my mother in my heart, you never had a choice, then I'm taking an entire category of people called abusers or wrongdoers or, you know, whatever. And I'm saying they don't have free will. They don't have a choice. But my mother did have a choice. So you say, well, she couldn't help what she did, but she did. She never committed violence against me in the presence of anybody who had authority, right? She didn't hit me in front of a policeman or a teacher or anything. So anytime that she could have experienced negative consequences for her violence or her abuse, she was magically able to restrain her behavior and put on a happy face and be nicer. It's just that behind closed doors, that was a different matter. So I can't say she couldn't help herself because you know what I think is someone like epilepsy or someone who has Tourette's and just blurts out inappropriate words, like they genuinely can't help themselves. Right. And I, I call it like the million dollar question. Like if you give someone, a, if you were a cruel person, you said to someone with epilepsy, I'll give you a million dollars if you don't have an epileptic attack. Well, they can't. It's, you know, it's like someone giving us a million dollars to have fine heads of hair. Well, actually, I don't know if you shave or not, but uh, for me, yeah. you know, I, a million dollars ain't going to grow me a fine head of hair. Maybe <laughs> I put some AstroTurf up there, but that's about the best I can do. And so the million dollar question is, could you change the behavior for a million dollars, right? So you say to someone who's got cancer, I'll give you a million dollars to not have cancer. Well, they still have cancer. You say to someone who's short, I give you a million dollars to be tall. They're still short. You say to somebody who's got epilepsy, I'll give you a million dollars to not have an epileptic attack. They will still have an epileptic attack. But if you say to someone who's an abuser, I'll give you a million dollars to not abuse your kids this week. 
they will be able to achieve it. And that's where the free will part comes in. So saying my mother couldn't choose better, that's tough. I mean, I'm not saying maybe it's all just a big elaborate emotional defense, but if I say to her, you don't have free will, well, I'm her child. How do I get free will then? Amazing question. I want to tell you that there's no such thing as a free will. And the reason that your mother didn't treat you that way in the public because she, the pressure of society caused her to contain that because had she done that in public, she could have been arrested or whatever, right? But behind closed doors, she was influenced to treat you that way. And uh, so she controlled within by evil, which is hatred, which is anger. And then she controlled outside by the pressure of the peers, the people around her, the law. So she was never in control at all. And we don't have a free will because if we had a free will, we would all be free. I would, I would be free. I would never do anything wrong. I would never have a wrong thought. I would always be my, you know, treat myself well, treat others well. And so if your mother had had any love at all, she would not have treated you that way. She simply did not have it. And she was controlled by the spirit of anger that was passed down to her. She resents her mother and all that. And she couldn't help herself. We don't have a free will. We're either influenced by evil. Uh, and if you have overcome that, you're influenced by good, which is of God. We are not in control, but the enemy of good, the, the dark force of the light, want you to think you have a free will and you don't. And a lot of people judge themselves because they're in situations and they're trying to will themselves out. But they can't get out, so they judge themselves. And when you judge yourself, you get worse rather than get better. So your mother, if she could have done better, if she had love, you would have received love from her. It's just not in her. Well, I think that's the core for me. It's the core of the issue. And it probably is for your listeners and, and, and others. And it's this. It is profoundly humiliating as a child to realize that your mother could treat you better, but she just doesn't have the incentive. In other words, if uh, there's a knock at the door and it's someone in authority, maybe it's the police or maybe it's the superintendent of the building or something. So she's doing something terrible to you. And then there's a knock on the door. And what does she do? She brushes her hair back. She stands <laughs> up straight. Uh, she she uh, uh, puts on a little bit of lipstick. She goes and answers the door. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and you, you realize she can flip like that, right? Yes. She can flip like that. I mean, I remember she be she had this kind of weird Jim Morrison screeching thing that would go on, and and then the phone would ring. She'd think it might be one of her boyfriends. Really, hi, you know, just immediately just flip right, right. Just from I understand. one sort of yeah, yeah. So that's the thing, right? So like some random boyfriend, some superintendent, some one knocking on the door, the phone ringing, all of that can turn her into a better person, but I can't. Yeah, but he's my not. existence doesn't. Do it does is not enough for her to turn into a better person but she's not even fact, a better I'm sorry sorry but in fact my existence seems to turn her to a worse person it's hard to feel like a good person when you feel like you bring out the worst in your mother if that makes sense right i understand that that's why we need good fathers in the home with the mother and the children so that the father can stand between the mother and the children and say you know what your mother is angry she's out of control don't resent her but speak up, but don't resent. Let me know and I'll deal with it. The father's supposed to protect the children from the mothers, but because most fathers haven't overcome their mothers, they don't know. They end up married to the person they hate. And so they don't mm -hmm. know how to deal with it. But uh, I want to ask you quickly, and then I, I want to hear more about this letter. Um, what do you think would happen if you went, if you realize, you know what? Yes, yeah, she's evil. Yes, what she did was wrong. Even though she put on this phony act when the police showed up, it's still not real. She's just being controlled or contained by the law. But the real her is still there. What do you think would happen if you realized she really couldn't help it and you went and forgave her? Hey, I forgive you for screwing up my life. It was evil. You were wrong. But I'm sorry for hating you for it. What do you think would happen? Well... Unfortunately, my mother is not of a mental state where that kind of conversation could happen. And I know that because I've tried to have not that exact conversation, but uh, conversations around reconciliation. Um, I had those, uh, 
probably 20, 25 years ago, because yeah. I, I was in talk therapy for a number of years and uh, worked over this kind of stuff. And uh, I did, I mean, I did try and have those conversations saying, you know, this is what happened. Let's talk about it reasonably and, and so on. And uh, yeah, it's tough, man. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, when you confront someone who's done you real wrong, uh, there's certainly, there's a little bit of startling that happens. And the sad thing is, I think what often happens, what happened with me, is you get to sit across a table with someone and you get to see them performing this calculation in their mind. What right. can I get away with? How can I, how can I turn this to my advantage? How can I uh, fog the person? How can I uh, misdirect the question? How can I, how much can I claim to not remember without looking ridiculous and all that? Like, it's really, really a tough, uh, it's like fighting this big foggy squid that can get inside your ears. And so I did have a number of those conversations and, uh, you know, did, did my very best and made my requests, you know, for her to stop talking about certain subjects that were disturbing to me and so on. And um, it just it just escalated and it, it went right <laughs> back to that kind of escalation. And so for me, it's like, OK, you know, I had the reasonable conversations. I tried my best and I tried saying I tried saying, look, let's say that everything that's happened to you medically is entirely true and, and I'll accept all of that and I, I'll be with you. Uh, but but. You know, there's things you can do to manage the symptoms, there's things you can do to manage the stress of your illnesses and so on. And again, just kaboom, right? Any kind of um, statement that went against her immediate preferences, she would just kind of escalate to the point of, I was just erased. But and I felt that it was actually bad for any chance for, for us, for both of us to to be in that in that kind of situation. So that's the conversations that I did have. Uh, I don't, right. I mean, I, I don't sort of sit there and seethe with resentment towards my mother every day. Uh, I actually don't think of her, you know, I'm a father myself, right. I've got a busy life and I don't uh, think about her. And and with regards to her, <laughs> uh, it, it is really, you know, it's a great line from um, in Hamlet. Someone asked Hamlet about the ghost of his father. He says it was more a, a countenance of sorrow than of anger. Right. Uh, and it is really, you know, my, my parents are two remarkable people, highly intelligent, uh, uh, great talents. Uh, and uh, I think to me, they're just, it's really an example of how tragic it can be to make those mistakes or to put it, I guess, in a more detailed manner, to make those mistakes and then do so little to unmake them. You know, we all make mistakes. Right. Of course we do. We, right? all, we all make yeah, mistakes. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a live show, right? So right. <laughs> you have it all every day. I have it every day. Yeah. I couldn't even say the word uh, um, or a word earlier in this in this show, sentimentality. So we all make mistakes. But to me, the great tragedy is holding on to those mistakes and not trying yeah. to make amends. So I did go as far as I could. Well, I shouldn't say because I've got free will, right? So. For me, I could go further. So I didn't go as far as the conversation that you say, but I did get to a place where I was trying to have reasonable conversations where I was present in the conversation. I was talking about what I thought, what I wanted, what I needed, and what I got back was um, uh, either minimization, indifference, or a very explosive escalation. Yeah. The, the one last thing about that, the beauty of this, <coughs> excuse me, the beauty is we are a spirit created in the image of God and we live in a body. The real person is a spirit created in the image of God. But then when we are born into families that are screwed up like this, we start to resent because we are born free. We we're born with love and not judgmental, but love. But then when we're born into crazy families like this, they cause us to become angry. And mm -hmm. anger, anger is the same as hatred. It's the same as resentment. And when you're, when you're angry, you play God. And you start to judge. You, you, know, you don't like him. You judge him. And, and the moment you do that, you fall away from your true identity and you wake up to the darkness that they're into because you become like them. So you lose the light and you're now in darkness. Your spirit is now in darkness. But when you forgive, that's why God said, if you have any problem with anyone, go and forgive them and I will forgive you. Meaning that your mother doesn't have to apologize for anything. She doesn't have to admit to anything. You don't need to have a long conversation with her. You just need to forgive her so God can forgive you. And you will re the real you <clears throat> will return to your natural state of being, which is a peace and which is a logic, which is a perfect love. But it doesn't mean you got to hang out with her. She doesn't need to admit to anything. 
And so you need to, it, that will cause you to go free. All that anger and doubts and all that would disappear because when you forgive her, I'm sorry for resenting you, mother. I realize you're crazy. I know you're angry. I'm sorry for resenting you. You could walk away and never have to look back again. Uh, you did tell me, you, what do you think about that? Seems kind of beta. <laughs> it does. I understand. It you, does. Listen, I mean, maybe it's just a, a man pride, but the idea that I would go and, and in a sense, apologize to somebody who. But you apologize for resenting a person who could not help themselves. Well, but that that's predicated on abandoning free will, man. I'm not doing that. I'm <laughs> not going to abandon. Because if she doesn't have a choice, then why are you trying to change my mind, right? If my mother doesn't have a choice, then I don't have a choice. And so, if I don't have a choice, why are you trying to convince me to do something different? So you'll be free from her. And then you will pass down love to your wife and your kids. Okay, but you are trying to change my mind about something, right? Not really. I'm just trying to, uh, I'm trying to inspire and get you to think about but something. But you're, you're trying to inspire me to change a course of action, right? Only if you can see that it's true, yes. If no, no, I get, I, listen, I get that you're trying to do me good, and I appreciate that. That's why I enjoy our conversation so yes. much. I really get that you're trying to do me a good, you're trying to do me a solid, as they, as they used to say <laughs> when I was a kid, right? Yeah. Um, this back in the 60s, right? Well, I was only four, I guess. But so I get that you're trying to do something positive for me, and I, I love you for it, and I appreciate that. I really, really do. Yeah. Uh, and so, but but nonetheless, you are still trying to get me to change my mind to consider a course of action yeah. that is beneficial to me and will be beneficial to my mother and will be beneficial to my family. And well, it might not of, benefit of, your mother, but it will benefit you and your family. Right. So you are trying to get me to change <laughs> my mind about something. Right. And I appreciate that. Yeah. But if so, but then the moment, the more that I can change my mind, the more my mother could have changed her mind. And that kind of puts me back to square one. Like Only these, she, these two dials, right? There's me and my mom. Yeah. If I up my free will and my choice, I up her free will and her choice. And so she's more responsible. Well, she's definitely responsible for herself. Do you. Oh, sorry. You I think, just lost your audio. Do you think that. Are you able to hear me now? I can't hear you. Oh, uh, what happened? Uh, hold on. Oh, sorry. Hold on a second. It says here your Internet connection is unstable. All right, one minute. Look at that. Oh, we're back. We're back. Oh, good. We're good. We're good. Do you think you have a right to hate her? But I don't hate her. Do you think you have a right to be angry at her? I'm not angry at her in the present. And and in in the past, I was certainly angry. As, you know, as a teenager, right? right. All, all good guys in particular with single moms go through this kind of flip, right? So you're you're under the thumb of your mom because you're small and she's big, and then you get bigger and she goes from doing this to doing this, uh, <laughs> and it kind of changes quite a bit, right? So yeah. uh, so I did go through a lot of anger and frustration at the sort of control and, and the bullying and, and all of that um, when I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, I've been on my own since I was 15 years old. So I had to escape that situation. I mean, it really was driving me to a very dangerous and, and right. terrible place. Absolutely. And so, yeah, there was a lot of anger back then. And I did try for a long time to have a more reasonable, like many, many, many years to have a more reasonable relationship. But I could not, I could not go in and self erase. Like I could not just erase myself and be there for some abstract thing like forgiveness. The only way that I could be there was to actually be there, to tell her honestly what was on my mind. And honestly, what was on my mind is let's talk about what happened. Because if we can't talk about what happened, I can't pretend that it didn't happen because then I'm here, but not here. And I don't want to be in relationships where I'm there, but not there. You know, like if you have friends and all you can do is get together and be drunk, but then you're there, but you're not there because right. you've killed your higher faculty. I wasn't going to be in a relationship with my mom where I couldn't tell her what I was thinking. And what I was thinking was about this stuff. And it wasn't about, oh, you're a terrible person and I'm a victim. Yeah, she was a terrible person. I was a victim. But as an adult, I have a different choice. And I, But I wasn't going to be there in the room with her right. and lie about my experience of being in the room with her. I was not going to bear false witness. That was my favorite commandment and always has been that I shall not bear false witness. So if I go in with something like uh, I forgive you and so on, I mean, you know, but is that an honest reflection of my thoughts at the time? Um, it wasn't then. But as far as being angry, I mean, the good thing about past and a half century is it's all pretty deep in the rear view by now. And I have a great life with my family and a, a great career with what I do. And there's not, um, oh, that's interesting. So there's not much to resent with her anymore, but it, it, it does sometimes see like uh, new enemies take the place of old enemies. Yes. And maybe that's what forgiveness is about. Yes, absolutely. Because once you forgive her, 
you all have a perfect love operating through you, and the enemies to come will not be able to harm you in any form or not. And they will try. They lie on you. They'll try to destroy your career. They destroy, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't harm you. I got to ask you this, though, because we run out of time, and I always yeah. enjoy talking to you. Um, um, the letter that you wrote for your father, is it a long letter? How long is it? Uh, it was not too long now. Are you able to read it to us now? Do you have it? No, unfortunately, this was about 30 years ago. Oh, I see. Is it up on your site or anywhere that people can read it? No, I was, uh, uh, it was sent, sent, and uh, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's long in the rear view. But no, it's just, I was just talking about uh, the history and the things that he didn't seem to know about my mother and the violence uh, and all of that. And uh, it was, you know, saying, let's, let's, let's talk about it. I mean, this is because that's an important thing. You know, it's a basic, it was, an, unfortunately, it was one of the most prevalent aspects of my childhood. And um, I just felt like I couldn't have an honest relationship with my father as long as I was hiding everything that happened. It's like, yeah. it's like being in some criminal gang. It's like you, you got to or, or like being it's like being in a crime gang and then being around honest people you got to hide everything about who you are and i just i'm tired of that you know yeah. like they really want to be authentic in the world and just stop you know this is why i'm talking about personal stuff with you in public i mean i'm just it's on my mind i think it's an important topic you, yes. you're a good friend who asks and i'm just tired of hiding everything you know and 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 pretending that uh things happened that didn't happen or didn't happen that did happen you know yeah. just the children of the lie right i mean it's uh, right. Uh, these, these lies start right this yeah. is where they start is in in falsifying your own history so you love your father <sighs> i would say that i accept all the reasons for his decisions i have massive sympathy for the way his life played out and I suppose I still feel a little upset that I didn't even know he was unwell. He lives uh, half a world away. Uh, I didn't know that he was uh, unwell. Uh, I only found out uh, after, after the fact. Uh, and I, I know that he didn't, like, he, yeah. So I, I guess I was a little uh, upset that um, uh, he didn't let me know. Uh, or, or give me now. Of course, you, he could. You could say that God was letting me know through you. Right? I had a conversation with you, and that was the prompt to go. Right. Yes. But um, no, I would. I wouldn't say that I love him, but I would say that. Oh, you know, I would certainly say like he gave me some great gifts, and the great gift that he gave me was um, just one six-hour bus ride that we were on, where he unpacked his whole life, and that was a great gift. Yeah. And I certainly respect him for that. I respect him for his, you know, his intellectual accomplishments were great. His career was pretty good. And he did stay married to his second wife for many decades. So um, there's a lot that that was positive in that. As far as love goes, got to tell you, you know, I didn't really know the man. And um, it's and I certainly don't know why he became or why he made the choices he made. In other words, why did he become who he was? I mean, when he, when he was an adult, he made choices. He explained right. those to me, but I don't know the source and that honest conversation about early experiences is what I try to bring to the world. Cause I think if we know everyone's history, the world makes sense. Like if we know what kind of furnaces people were forged in, if we know the origin story of people in an honest way, I think that we have much less conflict in the world. We can accept and understand why people make these kinds of choices. You know, why is someone a drug addict? Well, most likely because they were abused as a child. You know, why is this woman promiscuous? Well, she grew up without a dad and never talked about it. Or, you know, why is this guy so violent? Well, because he was beaten as a child. I mean, there's so much that we can unpack from our early histories that half the world makes sense in a way that we don't just get to sit on this high throne and cast these thunderbolts of judgment at everyone. Right. So. I accept. I accept. I'm not sure that I can transition to love for a guy I didn't really know, but so, I certainly accept and I don't hold him uh, accountable anymore. So as you know, I'm, I'm black and slow. Um, do you love your father? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But that doesn't mean I hate him. It doesn't mean that I resent <laughs> him. It doesn't mean that I, uh, I'm going to go and spit on his grave. <laughs> How old was he when he aspired? Oh... Uh, um, he, this is how little I know the guy, right? Um, 77, so yeah, early eighties. Oh, okay. Okay. And the last thing you said, your father helped you choose a great wife. How did he help you do that? 
well, he did not choose a great wife. So I learned From what his... not to do. <laughs> I understand. No, no, no. So like my mom was, was, was a beautiful woman, right? And <laughs> beautiful women are like the, they're the sirens, right? They're uh, in a way the devil for, for a lot of men because they can make you do crazy things. So I think he succumbed to physical beauty alone. Yeah. And of course, I had that temptation when I was younger. I was a fairly dashing young man myself. And I did pursue beauty off a cliff. Uh, a, a whole number of times before you just go, well, this this ride really is steady fun <laughs> at all. So, uh, you know, with no, I mean, my wife is a, is a lovely and wonderful woman uh, and uh, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed to have her in my life. And um, uh, I learned what not to choose. And he did give me that gift. And I also learned how to be very, very close to, uh, as a father uh, as well. Yeah. And because the distance, I know how much it can be destructive. So. That's been, you know, my father moved across the world. I barely leave my daughter's side. And I think that's that's a, another gift that you can get out of that situation. Right. Um, I um, did you tell me you were you are an atheist? Yes. You are an atheist, meaning that you don't yes. believe there is a God. Yes. Oh, OK. I thought you did. You know what, man? You made my day. I had only planned to hold <laughs> you over for 30 minutes. This hour is up already. Uh, tomorrow. The fallestate.tv interview discussion that we had will be premiered. Um, the live premiere is tomorrow at 12 noon Pacific time. I really, really appreciate you. I learned so much from you and because you're so honest about you. And I really do appreciate that. Thank you for your time today. How can people hear your radio show and read all your writing and read? the? Oh, the letter is not up, though. But how can no. people... Uh, yeah, so just you can go to freedomain.com and you can follow me on Twitter at Stefan Molyneux. The link is all on the website and all of that. And listen, I really, really appreciate this too. This is very much a two-way street. Uh, I do take what you say, although I fight you ferociously in the moment. <laughs> uh, I do go away with the Jesse Lee Peterson machinery churning away in my brain. So, uh, you know, the, this, this, this idea that you're passing across to me, uh, although I'm, I'm fighting you in the moment, yes. it does... I, I do consider it uh, afterwards. So so please don't think that you're just beating against the wall here. I like it, it gets through and, and I really do mull it over and I really, really do appreciate the care that you bring to my happiness. I totally understand that. Thank you too for your friendship and everything, man. I wish you well, your family well, and your father's situation going through that. We'll talk again. I appreciate you, all right? All right. Thanks, man. All right, buddy. Take care. All right, now, you Bye. too. Amazing. And don't forget to like, follow, tweet, subscribe, and share the Jesse Lee Peterson Radio Show, folks. We really appreciate it. We are at war. It is a spiritual battle for the soul of America. And it's going to take all of us to do it.